This conference will now be recorded. Hello and welcome to the International Lawyers Network's webinar. The ILN is an association of 91 high quality, full service and specialized law firms with over 5,000 lawyers worldwide, of which your firm is a valued member. The network provides clients with easily accessible legal services in 67 countries on six continents. Today's webinar is Social Impact and Sustainability, Do Law Firms Need to Care? There are growing expectations by all stakeholders for business to do social good and engage in more sustainable practices. What does this mean for law firms? Our speaker today, Pamela Cohn, is going to tell us. Pam is the founder and CEO of Amity Advisory and Global Social Responsibility Officer at Milliman. She has extensive marketing communications and business development experience with professional services firms, as well as deep expertise in corporate social responsibility. Pam, we're really looking forward to what you have to share with us today, so I will pass it over to you. Thank you so much, Lindsay. I'm so pleased to be here today to share some thoughts and to engage in conversation about this very important topic. Um, I will trust that if there are questions or something is not correct with the technology, Lindsay, that you will let me know. But otherwise, I'm assuming everybody can see my screen. Uh, so let's get started. Clearly, this topic is emerging as a very important topic these days. You can't watch the news without seeing um, coverage about climate change, social impact, and the role businesses should play. Larry Fink, who is the um, executive director, CEO of BlackRock Investments, has been sending a letter to CEOs for a couple of years now, emphasizing the importance of companies uh, focusing on more than just shareholder return, that they are a contributing member of society and they have to um, recognize the role they play in helping to address some of society's most pressing problems. In addition, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, they send out a year, uh, annual letter every year. Um, and this year's letter, again, focused on um, the issues in society that need to be solved, and it is not just NGOs or charities that are going to um, solve these issues. It also includes businesses. And then just more recently, um, in August, the Business Roundtable, which is a group of 200 large corporations in the, in the United States, they issued a proclamation stating that um, companies must take into consideration more than just shareholder return. They have to look at um, the communities in which they do business and all of the stakeholders that they touch. And just this week, um, you may have noticed the release of the book um, by the founder and CEO of Salesforce called Trailblazer, The Power of Business as the Greatest Platform for Change. Um, so all of these things together, in addition to the youth movement around climate change, um, are really strong indications that this trend is not going away, um, that this trend and these obligations by businesses are necessary. Um, and I hope that if you're a practicing lawyer, you recognize that there's a huge role for lawyers to play in addressing some of these um, societal challenges. So um, with respect to Milliman, which is where I work part time as a global social responsibility officer, um, I've been with the firm for 17 years, the first 15 years as chief marketing officer, and then the last two plus years as global social responsibility officer. And I'll tell you why I made that change in just a few minutes. But Milliman is structured very much like a law firm, a partnership. We have 70 offices around the world. Um, 4,000 employees, and we are a actuarial consulting firm, but we also have products and technology that support the actuarial space. So most of our clients are global and multinational insurance companies and financial institutions. And the reason I say that is that will be important when I start talking about why we have seen um, some of these trends perhaps earlier than law firms have seen them. 
our mission statement is we serve our clients to protect the health and financial well-being of people everywhere. So that's a very um, altruistic mission statement. And Milliman believes and certainly has behaved in the 70 years of our existence as very much a societal player. We very much focus on issues that are affecting society, everything from healthcare, the finance and delivery of healthcare, um, retirement security, uh, climate change and the resilience that companies need to address climate change, et cetera. So we thought we were doing all the right things and that we were an exemplary case of a business um, for the social good. However, we started to see about four years ago, and I suspect law firms around the world are starting to see very pointed, focused, detailed questions coming at us from clients and prospective clients, um, all about what is your commitment to sustainability? What is your commitment to code of conduct? Um, do you have a CSR policy? Do you have a sustainability code for your suppliers? And on the right hand side, my favorite one is tell us who's in charge of your social impact and sustainability program. And it better not be your CEO, because that tells me you're not taking this seriously. So when we started to see all of these sorts of questions, and this is just one example from clients and prospects, Initially, we thought this didn't apply to us. After all, we're their trusted providers in the actuarial space, just like law firms are trusted providers and, and trusted advisors um, in the legal space. However, um, we were wrong in that assumption that this didn't apply to us. It very much did apply to us. Um, about a year later, we started getting um, requests from our clients, again, global and multinational insurance companies and financial institutions and pension plans, um, to have a CSR audit of our social responsibility program and our sustainability practices. And again, we're a professional service firm. So we thought that these sorts of audits and assessments applied to their other supply chain vendors, but certainly not us. We were their trusted advisors, um, but it did apply to us. Um, and there is a company out of Paris called Ecovadis that many, many companies are now engaging in order to help grade and assess and audit all of their supply chain, including professional service providers, um, and doing an audit and issuing a report card. So what you're looking at here is Milliman's 2018 report card from Ecovadis. They assessed our environmental practices, our labor practices, our fair business practices, and our sustainable procurement practices. And then they showed us on the right-hand side how we benchmarked um, across um, other businesses in similar industries. So um, once, you, uh, once you have this score from Ecovadis, you can use it with any client who requests um, what your Ecovadis score is. And again, if you haven't seen this yet, um, it definitely is coming. We even recently had an RFP that stated all successful bidders will be requested to sign the Global Compact. Um, now, I suspect some people on the phone might not even know what the Global Compact is, um, but we quickly found out what the Global Compact is. Um, the Global Compact refers to the United Nations Global Compact, and that is an organization that companies can join. It's not uh, financially prohibitive to join, but when you join, you make a commitment to 10 principles around human rights, labor, environment, and anti-corruption, and that you will take actions and conduct your business in such a way to advance those societal goals. Um, so now if your prospects or your clients talk to you about the United Nations Global Compact, you'll recognize that this is what it is. In addition, once you join the United Nations Global Compact, you make a commitment to help make progress towards the sustainable development goals of the United Nations. 
Um, now, most law firms would not have any trouble um, talking about the work that they do that helps to make progress towards these goals. And that work should and could include more than just your pro bono cases. The work that you do with your clients to help make progress towards any of these goals should be part of your social responsibility and social impact story. I think the mistake that most law firms make today is they only talk about their pro bono cases when they're talking about their social responsibility program. I wanna draw attention to goal number 17, partnership for the goals. One of the underlying points of this goal is that you will do business with other companies, supply chain and um, uh, vendors who also are committed to these goals. So that I think is what's driving some of the pressure from clients and prospects with their vendors and suppliers. They wanna make sure if they're a member of the United Nations Global Compact that the people they do business with are also members of the Global Compact and striving to make progress towards these goals. And it's a huge and growing exponentially trend. So this chart, the most recent chart I could get from the UN was um, from 2017, where you can see there were 3,600 um, active collaboration partnerships for the goals. In 2018, it was 12,000. And in 2019 to date, it's in the 30,000s. So there's a huge exponential growth behind the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. So I tell you all of this because um, it is dangerous to ignore these trends. And the reason I know that is because Milliman experienced the fallout. Um, we had an existing client um, of our London office that sent us a questionnaire regarding our CSR and sustainability practices. We answered as best we could, um, but our answers were, the scores for our answers were so insufficient so low that our total score was insufficient to even make it to the second round. Um, and that was an existing client. It was a loss of dollars, of pounds and of euros. And the biggest drawback is we can't bid again for four more years. So multiply that financial loss by four years. Um, and suddenly we recognize that all of these um, social impact and sustainability issues really do apply to us and that our clients care and are taking action to do business with others who care. So that is when I made the move from corporate um, chief marketing officer to corporate social responsibility officer and established Milliman's formal social impact and responsibility program. We had always been doing things but we hadn't structured it in such a way that um, it was easy to tell our story and to be cohesive and holistic in our story. So after we chose our themes of our work, our people and our world, those are the three pillars of our social impact story. We also crowdsourced, what would you like our themes to be for the charitable and volunteer part of our social impact story. And the themes came out to be education, health and community investment, particularly where it concerns job creation. So I show you this structure because I think what most companies, what most firms fail to realize is that social impact and responsibility programs are much more than just charity and volunteering. So our themes include the work we do for our clients. And I mentioned some of this earlier in the retirement space and the healthcare space and the climate resiliency space, the actual work that our clients pay us to do has an impact in the social space. And we should talk about that as part of our social responsibility story. The Our People bucket um, is everything firms do to grow and nurture their people. And this includes mentorship programs, leadership academy, Milliman University, diversity and inclusion programs, scholarship programs, 
everything we do to make sure our people have a thriving and rewarding career. And then finally, under the world bucket is where the charity and, and philanthropy efforts live. It is where volunteering lives and it's where the environmental steps and sustainability steps that firms take. That's where that should live. Um, but as I mentioned, firms need to think much more holistically when they're talking about social impact and social responsibility than historically has been the practice. So we also joined the United Nations Global Compact, as you would suspect, because all of our insurance companies and, and um, financial institution companies clients are very much active. Um, and when you think about it, that makes sense because it is the insurance companies or the insurance industry that is already feeling the financial impact of some of these societal challenges, not the least of which is climate change, right? Insurance companies and reinsurance companies are already writing checks for the implications of climate change. Um, and so they're taking this very seriously. They're taking sustainability practices very seriously. Um, and I think other businesses will also soon be taking these um, societal problems quite seriously and will expect the people that they do business with to do so as well, including law firms. So the other thing we did is um, create a social media campaign, and this is mostly to engage people internally at the firm. We asked um, everybody at the firm to do a short video of themselves describing which goal was the most important to them and why. And Lindsay, I failed to ask you prior, if I play a video, will people be able to see it? You, yes, they should be able to. Okay, so I'm gonna play mine first. This is less than 30 seconds. So um, if you can't see this, Lindsay, then let me know, but I'll click play and see what happens. There's no sound. Uh, okay. Okay, so I won't play the videos, um, but I did one to encourage employees to do one um, for 30 seconds. And then our chairman of the firm also did one. And once the chairman um, aired his at some national meetings, um, the employee engagement um, really uh, erupted, I shall say. And the reason I emphasize this is because I think it's a mistake for firms to take steps like joining the United Nations Global Compact and committing to the sustainable goals without incredible internal support. Because the last thing you want to have happen is for a client to ask a lawyer, oh, I see that you joined the United Nations um, Global Compact. Um, and the lawyer doesn't know anything about it. So it shouldn't be a step that the board takes or that you know, your social responsibility officer signs. It needs to be firm-wide initiative and galvanizing program so that um, your lawyers and your staff and everybody is aware of it, familiar with it, and can talk to clients about it. So here's my definition of maturity stages of a social impact program. Most companies, in fact, I would be willing to say all companies have social impact programs that are at the transactional stage. Um, random acts of kindness based on requests that come in through the door. You get your photo taken with the big giant check when you make a charitable donation. And you're basically giving treasure, but you're not relating it to your time or your talent. The transitional phase is when you're a little bit more focused, perhaps you've developed some themes um, and you also perhaps engage in some volunteer time. But ultimately what we're all driving for is a much more transformational program. You're giving treasure, time and talent and you're collaborating with other organizations, whether that be clients, NGOs or nonprofits to achieve much greater outcomes. So what does transformational look like? And I'll give you some examples because there are some law firms that are doing some pretty cool stuff. Um, transformational needs to be core to the business. And what I mean by that is 
lawyers should be bringing their highest and best skills to whatever it is they're engaging in. This is why I am not a fan of lawyers spending their Saturdays pulling weeds in a park as a volunteer initiative. That is not the highest and best use of their time. The other example I give is actuaries should not be building homes for Habitat for Humanity. Putting a hammer in the hands of actuaries is not the highest and best use of their time. So look for opportunities and programs that are really core to their business. Then consistent with purpose. Um, whatever your firm's mission statement is, look for partnership, partnering organizations and social impact opportunities that are consistent with your purpose. Now, in order for that to work, your law firm actually has to know what its purpose is. So maybe the first step, if a law firm doesn't have a mission statement or a purpose statement, is to define what that is. And then third, and I've mentioned this a few times, um, collaborative in nature. No individual firm is going to achieve the level of outcomes that you could achieve if you partner with other organizations. Again, whether that be clients, NGOs, or nonprofits. Um, it's really important to work on these initiatives together, which is why goal number 17 of the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals calls for partnering with others for greater outcomes. And then finally, I would emphasize that a transformational social impact program is a program, not a project. In other words, it doesn't have an end. It is a process, not a single event. And it's important that we measure outcomes, not just output. So what are we trying to achieve over time? And sometimes those outcomes have to have a long timeline. And I'll give you an example. Three years ago, Milliman started a diversity scholarship program to increase the diversity in the actuarial profession. So we've had three classes of recipients so far, but it is too early to tell what difference does that make in increasing diversity in the profession. We will have to wait five or 10 years before we can measure the outcome of how many of those diverse actuarial student scholarship recipients actually stayed and thrived in the profession. Um, so we are set up to measure those outcomes, but those outcomes are long-term. So what are some trends in the legal industry? And there are some happening. Um, typically, a law firm's CSR program is very separate and very siloed. And these departments often don't even talk to each other if the firm is large. So they have a pro bono program. They have a diversity and inclusion initiative. They have a community engagement and volunteering program, often led by volunteer staff. Um, many firms have philanthropy and charitable giving, um, whichever client screams the loudest about sponsoring their golf tournaments, that's usually what the firm does. Um, and then there's also um, environmental efforts or a green team. Typically, none of these things are related. Um, and when a firm tells its social responsibility and social impact story, depending on who you talk to, you will get stories in one of these silos, but you're not gonna get the, the whole story. There are a few examples of the legal industry um, working together and creating some initiatives to address some of these um, social problems. There is something here in the US called a call to the bar, where lawyers are taking action together on climate change. Um, and then there's also a newly formed group, and I think there's 15 law firm members now. It started with 11, but I think now there's 15 lawyers for a sustainable economy. Um, so there are some initiatives going on that the legal industry is working on. Um, and frankly, I'm a proponent that of some of these, most of these really important social issues, if it isn't lawyers at the table leading these conversations, then who is, right? This is part of our obligation as the legal industry to not only help our firms with these issues, but also be trusted advisors to our clients who are also dealing with these issues. If not us, 
than who? Um, because I think there's nobody who understands the process and the regulations and what needs to happen for businesses to make some of these um, substantive changes. There are a few examples of firms doing some really interesting things. Herbert Smith um, is the only firm I know who talks about it holistically. You can see here in this example, they talk about our people, our governance and ethics, our environment and our communities. Allen and Overy is actually doing quite a good job of tracking their carbon footprint in, in a much more detailed way than any other firm I know of. Nixon Peabody has a wonderful program, which is a great example of what I call transformational social impact. They're environmental lawyers, they're real estate lawyers, two of their solar panel clients and two of their real estate development clients worked together to put solar panels on top of the buildings owned by that real estate, those real estate development clients and all the electricity being generated is credited to the low income housing projects in Washington, DC. That is transformational, sustainable in both senses of the words, right? It's, it's sustainable energy, but the program itself is also long lived and sustainable. It's collaborative in nature because they're working with clients and third party organizations, in this case, low income housing in Washington, DC. That example is, in my mind, the way lawyers should be thinking about what difference they could be making in the social impact space. Also, that example, um, they're, they're getting quite uh, noted and, and people are recognizing how transformational that program is. They are now putting solar panels on top of elementary schools and park pavilions um, as part of phase two of that project. And I might emphasize that this is not pro bono, at least not all of it was pro bono. This was work that they're doing with clients for social impact. There are also a number of industry bodies that law firms and lawyers should look into and become active in because that's where their clients are talking about these issues. And these are just a few of them. So in addition to your client industries, there are also law firm legal industry bodies that are addressing sustainability. Here in the United States, it's called Law Firm Sustainability Network. In Europe, in the UK, it's called Legal Sustainability Alliance. And in um, Australia, it's called Australian Legal Sector Alliance. So if your firm is not involved in your local legal industry sustain sustainability body, that would be a place to start, as well as the organizations that your clients belong to. So just quickly, the Law Firm Sustainability Network here in the US was started in 2011. Um, and its goal is to promote environmental sustainability of law firms, um, working together, best practices, um, indicators and benchmarks, et cetera. Here's just a handful of the firms that are already a member of the Law Firm Sustainability Network here in the US. And I did some research with the Law Firm Sustainability Network a year ago as part of my um, capstone project for a graduate program on social impact that I was taking at the University of Toronto. And some of the results were quite telling. Um, the outlook for law firm sustainability programs. Um, I, my favorite statistic on the right hand side there is 85% of law firms who responded to this survey have received an RFP that had sustainability questions and issues in it. Also, um, the most cited industry challenge and tackles for law firms is paper and travel. <clears throat> what I have seen is most firms do things like recycle paper, double copy or double sided copies, um, they may have composting in their kitchen. They may have employee commuter subsidies to help with um, carpooling and so forth. But I think very few firms focus on what is most dramatically contributing to um, carbon, their carbon footprint, and that is business travel, air travel. You can see on this graph, which is courtesy of a CO2 logic consulting company out of Madrid, Spain, 
They took a typical law firm of 500 employees with offices in five countries and estimated based on their um, expertise in this area, what the carbon footprint of such a firm would look like. And, you know, here we are all talking about paper recycling, which is probably the smallest contributor of our carbon footprint. Some firms focus on employee commuting. Some firms happen to be in LEED certified buildings. All of those things are good, but insufficient by far when it comes to really tackling what is contributing to our carbon footprint, and that is air travel. Now, the pushback I always get from firms is, yeah, but we have to travel to see our clients. So here's my suggestion there is, okay, so let's not start with client travel. Let's start with all the travel your firm undertakes for internal committee meetings. Do your various committees really need to meet four times a year or could they do two times a year and subs um, um, subsidize that with two or supplement that with two video conference meetings as an example. So number one, you don't have to start with client travel as the place to start uh, reducing your air travel. And number two, even if it is for client travel, think about client offsets. Um, there are clients now, by the way, who are requesting of their outside service providers, if you feel it is necessary to travel um, for business on our behalf, you will purchase carbon offsets for those trips. Um, so even clients are becoming much more sensitized to uh, the impact on climate footprint from air travel. I'm going to pause here just in case there are any questions. I've been doing a lot of talking. So far, no. I think it's a lot of great information. Um, if anybody does have any questions, you can pop them in the chat box. I'm keeping an eye on that uh, to pause and give those to Pam. Um, so, but yeah, please continue. Okay, terrific. Thanks. So here's, and I preached this a little bit earlier in the call. If it isn't lawyers, who is? most qualified to lead the initiatives on solving some of these societal problems. Personally, I'm a firm believer that it is lawyers in their roles at their law firms and in the advice they give with clients and serving as general counsel within companies that are best equipped, who are best equipped to address some of these issues. And I use John Lennon and Yoko Ono's song, Imagine, to um, spur some emotional connection to what it is we can do to make the world a better place. Um, and after all, what could be the worst thing that would happen if we all try? And with that, I again will be happy to take questions or um, you can email me afterwards if you don't want to ask a question right now. Great, Pam. Thanks so much. Um, I'm going to give everybody a minute or two if they have any questions for you. Um, I think that's really helpful. And thank you also for the resources that you've provided for everybody to get started in terms of where they may want to go in their own jurisdictions for um, next steps. Mm -hmm. um, we have also recorded this session, so if anybody did miss any piece of that, I'm going to be circulating it after the webinar, uh, probably tomorrow, so that if anybody has any questions or wants to review any of this, they'll have the opportunity, opportunity to do that then too. Okay, great. Thanks so much, everybody, and we will be following up with you on this. Thanks again, Pam. We really appreciate it. It was my pleasure, Lindsay. Have a great day. Thank you. Have a great day, everyone.